You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie in the US. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. The podcast hosted by two online friends who live on two continents and never met in real life, but who one day decided that it would be a great idea to start this weekly podcast. And here we are, four years later. Yeah, four years. And wow, are we bad with the organizational <laughs> side of things, right? We have once again completely missed our anniversary. And I even had plans. I was like going to try to get in touch with Philip and like send you flowers. I had a whole plan and then just forgot. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but you don't listen to us because you think we're going to be the most organized bitches in the casting world. It's like totally the opposite. Oh my God. Yeah. I think you're just here for our very, very, very eclectic taste and wide, random variety of topics that we discuss. Just as random as this podcast is, is our Patreon feed. Very random. And our Patreon members are truly such a big help in keeping this podcast afloat. And that's why we want to give a special shout out to our newest Patreon member, Aaron Burke. Thank you so much, Aaron, for your support and for your service. Aaron's in our Facebook group. He is a very, very talented artist and also a veteran. And I'm fascinated by his home. Every time he posts a photo with the pictures and paintings and photos, I just want to... I know. Look at everything. It's right? so interesting. Same. I think it must be weird when you're listening and you're like, oh, are the podcast hosts low-key stalking me? What? <laughs> yeah, we are. We're going to put your money aside in a special fund, Aaron. And when we've <laughs> saved enough of your money, we'll give it back to you for a commissioned <laughs> portrait of the bounty for Johanna. That's... <laughs> That's what's going on here. All right. One last thing about Patreon. We are running out of helium pins for our murder tier. I swear to God, some postal worker in Boston has like two dozen. I swear. So yeah, the last batch is on its way. But from this point on forward for everybody who joins after today, I think, we will switch it up a little bit, maybe. Yeah, yeah. we will switch it up a little bit. Truth be told, the pins, <laughs> they are fucking cute. Yeah. But they were kind of a horrible idea. <laughs> They're not great. Just for one thing, sending them out was a whole operation. Yeah. Because of the, th the thickness, and they apparently often got caught in the sorting machine, so many pins got lost in the mail. Poor Annie had to try to send them several times. Yeah, we have a lot of international participants and so then they were they were trying to get I had to fill out a customs declaration for every it was <laughs> it was such a nightmare. <laughs> You made, made them look like uh, invitations? Uh, yeah. Because that's what Shh, don't. most likely worked, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I tried to make them look like wedding invitations and <laughs> just added. I did everything right. I looked it up online on the post office website to see what I was supposed to do. So yeah. we're going to find something different. Yeah, we're thinking probably stickers, something like that. Something, uh, you know, that we can pop in an envelope and that can safely make it to you. I started to look into fun merch ideas like thin magnets, stickers, or even dog bandanas. We're not sure yet. Yeah. But yeah, we will switch it up a bit. But it will definitely be a Patreon exclusive. It's not something that is already on the merch store. No, so. no. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna figure it out. We'll probably make a post in the Patreon dashboard for mm. our murder tier folks just so we can figure out what makes the most sense and try to get a sense of what you'd prefer. We'll figure, we're going to all figure it out, but, you know, pop your head into that, that dashboard and just, um, if you care, and uh, let us know your thoughts. We'll get a post up there shortly. I did just mail out the last of the pins from late fall and winter. Yep. Those were super delayed. I'm very sorry. You guys, I think our regular listeners know that we lost my mother-in-law September and my uncle in November, and so it's been kind of a... um. It's just been a it's just been a year. So anyhow, mm. they're out, they're in the mail. We also I also sent out a few extras. Rory, yours is on the way, and Beverly, I think, Bev. So keep your eyes out for them, okay? All right. So what's happening today, Johanna? What are we doing? 
We'll talk more about this stuff all at the end. <laughs> In the last three episodes, the, the very labor-intense, heartbreaking, infuriating, terrifying episodes, Annie covered the alleged murder. <laughs> he totally did it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the call has to cover up everything. Uh, of Manzanita and Dolores Mearns, as well as the Lady of the Dunes, Ruth Marie Terry. Guy Rockwell Maldavin, or Mal Maldovin, yeah. was the alleged murderer. Uh, once more, Annie, that was an excellent job. I know how much work and research you did put into those episodes. Uh, by the way, before I forget it, some of you might have wondered about the ending of last week's episode. There was no something good, no outro, no nothing. This was a deliberate choice because we really wanted the episode to end with Ruth Marie Terry's name, a name that the Lady of the Dunes finally got back after 48 years. So yeah, that was an artistic choice. Absolutely. I liked it. It gave me goosebumps. I've li started listening to them now because I'm afraid that ads are going to get snuck in again, so... I think I got that under, under control as well. If you, if you, uh, struggled with weird ads, even three in a row lately, uh, we had some kind of problems with our podcast provider. I think I got it under control. I think I figured out how many uh, buttons, uh, I have to push and boxes I have to <laughs> uncheck in order to not I think get I did yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They make it's it a lot. hard. It's a lot. Yeah. So, long-time Hellions might have already expected it after those three very intense weeks. It's time for a palate cleanser episode, especially as the next two cases we will cover will be equally horrible as the Ruth Marie Terry one. Yeah. And that's why we decided that this week would be the perfect week for one of the most soul-warming, enjoyable, good time, melts-your-heart topics we could think of, but also keep your tissue box close because we're gonna be talking about dogs yeah keep your tissue we're not talking about the no murder of dog too heartwarming sweet amazing true one definitely true one true in our hearts but maybe true stories of awesome dogs in history yeah so don't don't worry the mosquito rule will always apply <laughs> Yeah, uh, we just love dogs. Everything in our lives is better with dogs. And so today we would like to present to you a couple of the most, I don't want to say the most wonderful dogs or the most amazing, because they're all wonderful and amazing. So let's say some of the most remembered dogs in history. And for that, as usual, we need to talk a bit about the history of dogs and the bond that formed between dogs and humans. The relationship between dogs and humans is one of the oldest and most enduring partnerships in history. From ancient times to the present day, dogs have played an essential role in human society, serving as protectors, hunters, herders, rescuers, supporters, and companions. But how, when, and why did it all start? Well, the domestication of dogs is believed to have occurred between 15,000 and 30,000 years ago. Some scientists even say up to 45,000 years. The exact date is still a topic of debate among researchers. However, there is evidence that dogs were domesticated before the rise of agriculture, making them one of the first animals to be domesticated by humans. And we did talk about the domestication of livestock a little bit already, back in episode 182, the Fresh Health Food Court, so thinking that humans most likely had canine companions before an animal that would give them eggs or milk or meat is really remarkable. Think about it. It is, yeah. They preferred to domesticate an animal that would aid them before yeah. they would domesticate an animal that they could eat or that would nourish them. Yeah. Also, as far as I can think, the wolves were the only big carnivores to be truly domesticated. And honestly, I read so many articles about wolves and their history and biology for this episode and other episodes. And it's also tremendously fascinating. Uh, for example, did you know that wolves are considered the first pastoralists? Because what they did was th they were thinning the reindeer herds. They were killing the sick and weak ones. That was a long time before humans ever started to take care of herds. Yes, there is a great wolf sanctuary not far from me in Ipswich, Massachusetts, actually, that does really fantastic, very educational presentations on wolves and how vital they are to really the entire ecosystem. It's called Wolf Hollow. It's one of our favorite charities. 
We'll definitely go when you visit. And if anyone is in the area, I recommend checking them out. It's so funny. We have one close to where I live as well. It's just a 30 minutes drive. It's called nice. uh, Ernst Brunn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. I love, I just the, even just the like indigenous Native American stories of how dogs came to be, they all make me cry. They're all, I love the origin stories of all of this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think we could do a whole episode on wolves alone. Also, do I remember correctly, did we talk a l at least a little bit about wolves in the Beast of Chivaudan episode? I think so. Definitely. Maybe some others, too. There are no mm. lack of wolves as the villain in older stories, that's for sure. But they're, they're amazing. We need wolves, actually. They need to be protected. All right. Okay, let's continue. So we don't know since when dogs accompany us, but we do know that humans already had dogs at least 14,000 years ago. How do we know that? Because of the Bonn Oberkassel double burial. In 1914, in a stone quarry in Germany near Bonn, workers discovered a burial ground stemming from the Ice Age. What was found was quite fascinating. Two skeletons, a man and a woman, several artifacts, And what was first believed to be one dog, but apparently now scientists think it was actually two dogs, an older, smaller one, and a juvenile larger dog, who were buried with their owners. Hmm. The process of domestication likely began when wolves began scavenging around human settlements, attracted by the food left behind, and over time the wolves that were less fearful of humans and more willing to approach them were more likely to be fed, leading to the development of a mutual beneficial relationship between humans and wolves. There's also another theory that it were the weakest wolves, the sickly ones who wouldn't have been able to survive without help, who would most likely seek contact to human settlements. However it ultimately happened, uh, we can only guess, but we sure as hell are very glad it did happen. Oh yeah. Because these wolves eventually evolved into dogs through a process of artificial selection in which humans chose to breed the animals with the most desirable traits, such as loyalty, intelligence, and the ability to perform specific tasks. The earliest dog breeds were likely used for hunting and guarding, and it's honestly fascinating how long certain dog breeds already exist. Any. Any idea what's considered the oldest dog breed that's still around today? I don't know. I feel like I should really know this. I would guess maybe the Sholo. That's what I thought at first. Or the Husky or Malamute, because they look more like wolves, maybe. I, I wish I, I, I'm embarrassed I don't know this. You thought show low too, though. I thought so too. I love them so much. I want one so badly. I think it would look amazing as a sibling to Opus. Well, it used to be that scientists or experts uh, thought it was the Saluki oh. that held the record. I think it's even still in the Guinness Book of World Records, They're named beautiful. as the oldest dog breed. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know, the Saluki is a breed of hunting dog, and it dates back to ancient Egypt, where they were often depicted in artwork alongside They're human companions. The Saluki is a graceful and elegant breed of dog that is known for its very slender, very athletic build, uh, a long, narrow head with very expressive eyes. They are sight hound, which means they are primarily bred for hunting and chasing prey using their eyesight and speed. If you compare it to a beagle, a beagle is the scent. They just go after the scent. Yeah, Salukis are like if a greyhound had like long hair around the ears, yeah. like a, a longer coat. They're beautiful. They combine speed, athleticism, and intelligence, and it's definitely a dog breed that needs a lot of exercise and a very active human. Uh, Saluk is also known as Persian greyhounds, by the oh. way. See, that may <laughs> make sense, yeah? Yeah. Anyway, nowadays experts think that there are other older dog breeds, most likely the Besenji. Maybe Akita Inus, which surprised me, to be honest. Oh, the Akita. I could see that. Alaskan Malamutes or the Siberian Husky. So you were not too far off. You actually guessed too correctly. Paul loves Huskies. He loves them. But I am already too dramatic for this family. We don't need any more <laughs> drama or loud singing in this house. I just, I can't imagine. They're very uh, vocal. <laughs> very vocal. Yeah. So dogs played an important role in many ancient societies. In ancient Egypt, dogs were highly valued and often mummified and buried with their owners. 
They were also used as hunting dogs and their images, as I said, were frequently depicted in artwork and hieroglyphs. In ancient Greece, dogs were associated with the god Hades, who was often depicted with a three-headed dog named Cerberus, guarding the underworld. Also, infant Zeus was protected by Lelaps, a golden dog, and the only one recognizing Odysseus after his literal odyssey was his faithful dog Argos. <laughs> dogs were also used for hunting, and the Greeks developed several breeds, including the Molossus, which was used as a guard dog. In ancient Rome, dogs were used for hunting, herding, and as guard dogs as well. The Romans also developed several breeds, including the Mastiff and the Greyhound. And in addition, they trained dogs for use in warfare, uh, using them to attack enemy soldiers and to carry messages. Let's talk a bit more about the fact that Saleukis or dogs similar to Saleukis were depicted in Egyptian artwork. Because I think that's an indicator that pretty much from the beginning, Dogs were more to us than simple aids in daily tasks. They were companions and friends as well. In the Roman Empire, many houses would have mosaics in the entrance area warning everyone who entered of the dog, Cave Canem. One of those mosaics was found in Pompeii, for example. Oh, when we went to Sudley Castle, where Henry VIII's last wife, Catherine, survived and lived, the souvenir that I got myself is a replica of a little terracotta it's supposed to be like a very, I'll take a picture of it, very, very old carving at Sudley Castle, but it's of a dog and it says, here lives a very fine dog indeed. So they're everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. To the Romans, as well as to the Greeks, a beloved dog was just as much a member of the family as they are for us in modern days. And we know that because there are some dog graves that stood the test of time and some even have an epitaph left to read. And we're going to quote a couple of them. Yeah. Quote, To Helena, foster child, so without comparison and deserving of praise. End quote. Quote, My eyes were wet with tears, our little dog, when I bore thee to the grave. So, Patricius, never again shall thou give me a thousand kisses, never canst thou be contentedly in my lap. In sadness I have buried thee, and thou deservest. In a resting place of marble, I have put thee for all time by the side of my shade. In thy qualities, sagacious, thou wert like a human being. Ah, me, what a loved companion we have lost. End quote. Quote, I'm in tears while carrying you to your last resting place as much as I rejoiced when bringing you home in my own hands 15 years ago. End quote. <laughs> Sorry. Today's the anniversary of when we lost Blossom, so it's very apt day for it. Quote, Thou who passest on this path, if haply thou dost mark this monument, laugh not, I pray thee, though it is a dog's grave. Tears fell for me. Like, I, what is wrong with me? <laughs> like, yeah, plus, we are really crying about dogs that died in the Roman Empire. I know. Like, they <laughs> are dust. <laughs> they are. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, I'm fine. This is not... <laughs> this is not how my nervous breakdown starts. <clears throat> Quote, Thou who passest on this path... If haply thou dost mark this monument, laugh not, I pray thee, though it is a dog's grave. Tears fell for me, and the dust was heaped above me by a master's hand. End quote. Quote, Mia never barked without reason, but now he's silent. End quote. Quote, this is the tomb of a dog, Stephanos, who perished, whom Rodope shed tears for and buried like a human. I am the dog, Stephanos, and Rodope. Set up a tomb for me. End quote. Quote, Behold the tomb of Aeolus, the cheerful little dog, whose loss too fleeting fate pained me beyond measure. End quote. Okay. All right. The Roman Empire fell, but the love for dogs continued to play an important role in society. Just like before, they were used for hunting and herding and as guard dogs, and were often given as gifts to royalty and nobility. The nobility also developed several breeds, including the Great Dane, the Bloodhound, oh god, I love a Bloodhound, and the St. Bernard. It's still so weird to me that it's called Great Dane in English as it's originally from Germany and it's called Deutsche Dogge in German. 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's the German Mastiff is what a Great Dane is, the German Mastiff. I think Great Danes, and someone I'm sure will let me know if I've got it wrong, I believe they're a cross between an English Mastiff and an Irish Wolfhound, like a really mm-hmm. old, old cross of those two. Those are very both ancient breeds, right? And they were originally boar hounds for hunting, but then over time they also guarded bed chambers, and then they eventually ended up in the bed, and now they're terrible <laughs> hunters. They're terrible terrible hunters and they're very snuggly they're app lap dogs with too many elbows there's a drool situation that cannot be underestimated they're the best and then the dane thing my understanding is they changed the name it was after the first world war just because of anti-german yeah, sentiment yeah that's all it was a it was an anti-german yeah, sentiment sense. thing and then so all of a sudden it became the great dane and it was like eh it doesn't really have anything <laughs> to do with any, but it's fine. We could talk a lot more. We should do a Patreon episode where we just talk about our dogs, like our chi- our yeah. dogs growing up and about, yeah, that would be a really fun episode. But now we're going to tell you about a couple of these very good girls and boys. And we're going to start with Grey Friars Bobby, which has a very special place in my heart. So shout out to my cousin Amy, who is a listener in London. Her late father, Robin, was just the best. Paul and I were over in 2011 on a big road trip all over the UK, visiting family and friends, and so we were able to meet up with Amy and her folks, who are technically the aunt and uncle of my late husband, for those trying to work out who I'm talking about. So we're in the East End, we're having a nice curry, and Robin, who is Scottish, told us about Greyfriars Bobby. And I just sat there while he's telling me the sort of the tale, the legend of Greyfriars Bobby. And I am ugly crying into my korma. But we went, we added it, we cut some stuff off the list and switched it up and went to see Greyfriars Bobby. And now I am going to tell you the story of it first told to me by Robin. And we'll see how much I can get through without crying. And I have so many pictures to share with you all. And I'm going to be back here again this summer with my dad. Greyfriars Bobby was a small Skye Terrier who became famous in 19th century Scotland for his remarkable loyalty to his owner, John Grey. The story of Greyfriars Bobby begins in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1858, when John Grey, a night watchman, took in a small Skye Terrier puppy that he named Bobby. Grey and Bobby quickly became inseparable companions, and the dog accompanied him on his nightly patrols of the city. Sadly, John Grey died of tuberculosis and was buried in Greyfriars Kirkyard, a nearby cemetery. After the funeral, Bobby reportedly refused to leave his owner's graveside and spent the next 14 years of his life guarding Grey's grave, even in the harshest of Scottish weather. He would leave only briefly each day to eat and drink, but always return to keep watch over his human's final resting place. Bobby's devotion to John Grey quickly made him a beloved figure in Edinburgh. People would come from all over the city to see him and bring him food, water, and blankets to keep him warm. The Lord Provost of Edinburgh even issued a special collar for Bobby, which identified him as a free dog exempt from the city's dog tax. Bobby's story gained national attention in 1867 when a local newspaper published an article about the loyal dog. This is from the Caledonian Mercury, Edinburgh, Scotland, Monday, April 15th, 1867. Strange Story of a Dog. Quote, A very singular and interesting occurrence was brought to light in the Burr Court on Friday by the hearing of a summons in regard to a dog tax. Eight and a half years ago, it seems, a man named Gray, of whom nothing is known except that he was poor and lived in a quiet way in some obscure part of the town, was buried in Old Greyfriars Churchyard. His grave, leveled by the hand of time and unmarked by any stone, is now scarcely discernible. But though no human interest would seem to attach to it, the sacred spot has not been wholly disregarded and forgotten. During all these years, the dead man's faithful dog has kept constant watch and guard over the grave, and it was this animal for which the collector sought to recover the tax. James Brown, the old curator of the burial ground, remembers Gray's funeral and the dog, a Scotch terrier, was, he says, one of the most conspicuous of the mourners. The grave was closed in as usual, and the next morning, Bobby, as the dog is called, was found lying on the newly made bound. 
This was an innovation which old James could not permit, for there was an order at the gate stating, in the most intelligible characters, that dogs were not admitted. (laughs) Bobby was accordingly driven out, but the next morning he was there again, and for the second time was discharged. The third morning was cold and wet, and when the old man saw the faithful animal, in spite of all chastisement, still laying shivering on the grave, he took pity on him and gave him some food. This recognition of his devotion gave Bobby the right to make the churchyard his home, and from that time to the present, he has never spent a night away from his master's grave. Often in bad weather, attempts have been made to keep him within doors, but by dismal howls he has succeeded in making it known that this interference is not agreeable to him, and laterally he has always been allowed to have his way. That's a fucking terrier for you, man. At almost any time during the day, he may be seen in or about the churchyard, and no matter how rough the night may be, nothing can induce him to forsake the hollowed spot whose identity, despite the irresistible obliteration it has undergone, he has so faithfully preserved. Bobby has many friends, and the tax gatherers have by no means proved his enemies. A weekly treat of stakes was long allowed him by Sergeant Scott of the Engineers, but for more than six years he has been regularly fed by Mr. John Trail of the restaurant, Six Greyfriars Place. He is constant and punctual in his calls, being guided in his midday visits by the sound of the time gun. On the ground of harboring the dog in this way, proceedings were taken against Mr. Trail for payment of the tax. The defendant expressed his willingness, could he claim the dog, to be responsible for the tax, but so long as the animal refused to attach himself to anyone, it was impossible, he argued, to fix the ownership, and the court, seeing the peculiar circumstances of the case, dismissed the summons. Bobby has long been an object of curiosity to all who have become acquainted with his interesting history. His constant appearance in the graveyard has caused many inquiries to be made regarding him, and efforts out of a number have been made from time to time to get possession of him. Everybody wants this dog. They just love him, and he is not having it. It continues, The old curator, of course, stands up as the next claimant to Mr. Trail, and yesterday offered to pay the tax himself rather than to have Bobby... Greyfriars Bobby, to allow him his full name, put out of the way. The Scotsman. End quote. So, that's amazing. The time gun they're talking about is every afternoon at one o'clock, the castle fires a cannon uh, that you can set your watch to in the port. Yeah. I'm so proud of myself for mostly getting through that. I was... I can't (laughs) even tell you. I'm like, so you slept on the grave all wet and cold? Like, I was... It was fine. And so people began to visit Greyfriars Kirkyard just to see Bobby. Despite his fame, Bobby remained dedicated to his duty of guarding John Gray's grave. In 1872, after 14 years of guarding John Gray's grave, Bobby passed away. He was buried just inside the gates of Greyfriars Kirkyard, not far from his owner's grave. The people of Edinburgh mourned Bobby's passing, and his story quickly became legend. In the years since his death, Greyfriars Bobby has been celebrated in countless books, songs, and films. A bronze statue of Bobby now stands outside the entrance to Greyfriars Kirkyard, and his story has become a symbol of loyalty and devotion to dog lovers around the world. It's really amazing, actually, like when we went there and people are very proud of of Bobby and Mm. protective of Bobby. He's the embodiment of the things I think that Scottish people are are proud of, you know? And yeah. you can still visit his grave today and pay tribute to his unwavering loyalty to his owner. And while the story of Greyfriars Bobby may be over 150 years old, his legend continues to inspire and captivate people all around the world. I also want to mention that the story of Bobby might have been embellished over time, and it's possible some lore was added. If you don't want to be disillusioned, maybe skip the next two minutes. It's quite possible that the whole story was actually made up. I mean, the dog definitely existed, or I should say, dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Scandal. In 2012, a man named Jan... (laughs) It's a great fucking name. Jan Bondson. That's a great name. Jan Bondson wrote a book entitled, Greyfriars Bobby, the Most Faithful Dog in the World. 
In it, the author speculates that Bobby was one of the many graveyard dogs that could be found in cemeteries around the world, basically stray dogs that enjoy the quiet and peace at the cemetery, and they would lie on the top of graves to enjoy the warmth of the sun and receive treats by visitors. Legends and rumors started to spread, saying that these dogs were lying on top of the graves of their deceased owners, and they were praised for their loyalty. Cemetery dogs are still a thing in some places. I saw so many in Sarajevo, for example. Yeah, I thought they're nice. But Bobby did exist. The only thing is there's a chance, after the article came out and made him famous, there's a, there's a chance that he might have been, like, goldfished. He might have passed away and then replaced with mm. another dog that looked just like him so that people weren't disappointed explaining why Bobby lived to be 18. Although... I don't think it's that rare, actually, that he lived to be 18. But our family Beagle, I think I told you, our Beagle lived to be 18. She was, like, blind and deaf. She had doggy dementia, so she'd, she'd wait to go out. You'd take her out, go for a walk, whatever, come back in, and then she'd pee on the rug and go to sleep. Yeah. It was fine. She had no pain, no, no mobility issues. You know, she was, she still loved her food. She liked to, you know, she was still herself, you know, slept in her sunbeam, yeah. liked car rides. She liked to still try to get out and chase things, even if she couldn't see anything. I got her from a free to good home ad in the classifieds when I was home six with the chicken, sick with the chicken pox in fifth grade. And she survived to meet my late husband. Like she, mm. yeah, Jam's going to be at least 18. Dog food today is so much better than what we had in the 80s. She lived to be 18 on Alpo. The age doesn't even bother me with Bobby because especially smaller breeds. Yes. Uh, it's not unusual for smaller breeds to, to live well into their 15, 16, 17, 18 years. It's never long enough. It's the only, it's really never. the only downside to a dog, honestly, is their lifespan is just too short. So, oh, Bonson also speculates that Bobby was probably a dandy Didmount terrier, not a Sky terrier, but God loves a terrier. That was for the review who told us that uh, she liked my comment about soup because that's from the favorite same movie. Okay. You know what? I think I would prefer Bobby to be some stray graveyard dog who just enjoyed a lot of attention after the article instead of being a sad little doggy mourning the death of his human companion, right? Totally agree. I would love the idea that he was just a random cemetery dog that all of a sudden one day was like king of the yeah. cemetery dogs. <laughs> Got steak every week. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. I mean, we know that dogs can be super loyal. Most dogs. Leela is definitely a loyal dog. Jam is an opportunist. He surely loves me. I know he loves me, yeah. but he would trade me for food. He's a hound dog. Any food <laughs> would do. He would miss me afterwards, but... Food. Food. Yeah. I, no, I get it. Ovis is the first dog we've ever had who is not food motivated. And Johanna, it's so weird. He's terrible at dog. We joke all the time at how bad he is at dog <laughs> and how the dog needs a dog. That's the whole thing we're starting to look now. But he'll eat, a, like, a dog cookie, and it'll, because of his face, because of how his face is, it'll get stuck in his jowls <laughs> and then just fall out, and he'll leave it. So the, there's, like, we're constantly, we, you know how people with toddlers and kids step on Legos? Yeah. We step on, like, two inch long, because remember, he's a Great Dane, so these cookies are bigger than my <laughs> fucking cookies. They're big cookies. <laughs> and he leaves these, like, razor sharp, two inch shards of dog cookies all over they're everywhere all over my house and our dog needs a dog if that dog won't need any cookies he will probably have to go on a diet just based on the amount of cookies that fall from <laughs> opus's face on the regular it's fine but i love that the dog stands for loyalty and devotion and you know the statue of yeah. Greyfriars bobby because whether or not it's a true story like you said dogs are just the most devoted and loving not that cats aren't awesome but dogs, dogs have a different level, generally speaking. And also, Greyfriars Kirkyard is a legit, amazing, amazing, spooky old burial ground, like lots of Victorian death imagery. And when we went last time, it was a great visit, but it was pouring rain and freezing cold. So we didn't really spend as much time as we would have liked to. So I'm really hoping that on my next visit, I'll get lots and lots of great videos and photo to share because... There's like old vaults. It is a great cemetery. It's like a, yeah, it's proper. So I kept thinking about which famous dog I want to talk about. I had Hachiko on my list, but oh my God. No. It's just too sad. Thank you. 
Especially that we already talked about Bobby, right? So yeah. it's like, uh, no, I can't. I don't know. It's so sad. Then I thought, how about Togo and Balto? But this is such a big story with so much history around it that I really want to do a whole episode. I can't just, you know, talk about this for 10 minutes. No, Balto is, that's for sure its own episode. That whole story is amazing. Yeah. It's on the ever-growing list of things I want to make an episode about one day. <laughs> it's good. We're not... We're not running out of ideas, right? It's, no, never. Although never. somehow I have an I have a list of like 200 things I want to cover. And there are a lot of weeks when I'm like, no, none of those are right. Yeah, same, <laughs> same. You have to be in the right mood for the right story. It's weird, yeah. For those of you who don't know, Belto and uh, Togo were two of the lead dogs in the medicine run to Nome, Alaska in 1925. So yeah, there are so many brave, loyal, heroic dogs out there. And they all would deserve to be talked about. Ultimately, I decided that I would love to talk about the kind of first therapy dog on record. Smokey, a small 1.8 kilo of 4 pound Yorkshire Terrier who served during World War II as a therapy dog, entertainer and mascot. Oh, they are so cute. But Opus weighed more than that as an eight week old puppy. Like that mm -hmm. is Tiny. Teeny tiny. Tammy and friend of the show, she did our business card design and she's a moderator in our Facebook group. She had Jackson, who she lost about a year ago. And she and her husband have adopted two more. I think one's a Yorkie and one's a Morkie. And they're tiny. They're so tiny. And I always used to say that's what I wanted after Tuck. I wanted a tiny dog that I could carry around in my purse and knit sweaters for. <laughs> and then I got a Great Dane. Yeah. No and regrets. Now you have a dog that can carry you around in his purse. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was in february of 1944 in new guinea when an american soldier found a tiny dog in a foxhole where did she come from how did she end up in the foxhole in the jungle nobody knew the soldier assumed that she must have belonged to a japanese soldier but it was soon clear that the dog didn't understand any japanese or english commands now what to do with this underfed, skinny little being? Well, the finder took her back to camp and one of his buddies thought that that poor dog must feel very hot with its long fur and so they decided to shave her. I always think that everyone out there is as much of a dog person as we are and so I tend to think that everyone knows the different breeds, you know, at least the most common ones. But that's obviously nonsense, just as I don't know the different cat breeds, like, at all. I have no idea. I know, like, three maybe. Yeah. So let's give you the basic facts about Yorkshire Terriers. A Yorkshire Terrier, or Yorkie for short, is a small breed of dog that originated in the county of Yorkshire in northern England during the 19th century. They were originally bred as ratters, so that's dogs that are specifically bred to catch and kill vermin. They were brought to mills, factories and even mines to help control the amount of rats and mice there. But that's not all Yorkies were used for. The Yorkshire Terrier had a very natural talent for tracking and capturing animals that resided in underground dens and burrows scattered across the forest floors. For this reason, hunters would bring them along with them in their pockets, <laughs> uh, just like beagles, by the way. They used to, to be in the pockets of the, of the saddles of the horses. GM's the little one, right? I know I, I ask you this every single time, but until I meet him in person... Nothing you tell me will become he's permanent. Big. He's big. He's huge. Oh, so he's the bigger, he's the 16-inch beagle. He's the bigger beagle. He's the big boy. I can never in, tell. In Europe, you almost don't have the smaller beagles anymore. They're now uh, considered the American beagle. I was going to say. bigger ones. And even with the bigger ones, he's huge. He was the second tallest beagle of his when we went to the beagle playground. Oh, he's a monster chunky boy. Okay, the Yorkshire Terriers are there in the in the pockets of the hunters, <laughs> <laughs> and the hunters are pursuing the foxes and the badgers. And uh, oh, badgers are freaking dangerous, by the way. <laughs> a badger and other small to medium sized wildlife. And we all know that animals who get cornered in their dens, they can become quite aggressive, especially when protecting their young. Oh yeah. But Yorkies, they were known for their fearlessness in going after their prey, and they had a high rate of success in doing so. Although they were at home in, in the great outdoors and in the mines and in the, in the mills, uh, it wasn't long before the Yorkshire Terrier gained a reputation for being an exceptional companion animal. You know, with the petite size, intelligence, and very animated personalities. 
they quickly won the hearts of many people and their popularity spread beyond the forest and into the households, especially during the Victorian era. Oh, yeah. Yorkies typically weigh between 1.8 and 3 kilograms, so that's between 4 and 7 pounds, and they stand between 16 and 23 centimeters tall, so that's between 6 and 9 inches. Teeny tiny. Tiny. That's shoulder height, by the way. Yeah. They have a long, silky coat of hair that is usually dark steel gray and tan in color, Although there are other variations, and they are known for their perky ears, small size, and their very big, confident personality. Yeah. I hear they are small dogs with a very big personality. Yeah, I like Yorkies. They do have a big dog. They have big dog vibes in a small dog body. Yeah. Yeah. They are fearless, yeah. Yeah. And as I said, they, they have a very unique coat. So this is from YorkieInfoCenter.com, and it says, quote, the Yorkshire Terrier has a beautiful and unique coat that is one of the defining features of the breed. Most Yorkshire Terriers have silky coat. It is one of the defining traits of this breed. The AKC breed standard describes this as, quote, hair is glossy, fine, and silky in texture. It is also straight and capable of growing quite long. This is seen in the breed standard as well with, quote, coat on the body is moderately long and perfectly straight, end quote. Those are the ones you see in, I feel like those are the Yorkies that you only see in dog shows where their hair like perfectly touches the ground and they're so silky and shiny and that you can't even see their tiny little feet moving. They're just like a perfect, oh God, they're so cute usually. So then it goes on, quote, some Yorkies have a much different type of coat often referred to as a cotton coat. This is considered a major fault and these dogs should not be bred since coat texture is a hereditary trait. So that would be a companion dog. That said, there's nothing wrong with having a pet Yorkshire Terrier with a cotton coat. There will, however, be more upkeep and grooming. Cotton-type coats are much thicker, are not able to grow long, and hairs often have a wave to them. Even though the coat cannot reach floor length as it grows, the wavy hairs curl back into themselves, making for a dense coat that is exceedingly prone to developing mats. For this reason, most owners opt to keep the coat short. Yorkshire Terriers have a coat of hair, not fur. You may be wondering what the differences are. Hair is usually able to grow much longer than fur. Hair goes through a slower renewal cycle of growth, rest, and fallout, thus causing far less shedding. Hair generally has a smoother texture. Breeds like the Yorkshire Terrier do not have sturdy guard hairs. Hair is less densely packed with fewer follicles per square inch. This breed has a single-layer coat. Many breeds have a double-layer coat. The Yorkshire Terrier, however, has a single layer of hair similar to humans. In rare cases of cotton coats, there may appear to be an undercoat since the coat can be dense. And in even rarer cases, a silky coat may be double layered. However, this is not seen very often. End quote. So yeah, the Yorkshire Terriers do require regular grooming to maintain the, the long coat. Mm. And so it might not have been the worst idea to shave the little dog's hair, given that they were in the middle of a war in the southwest Pacific. (laughs) Not the most time to detangle. But as one can imagine, the soldiers were not the most experienced pet groomers. They also probably didn't have enough time or patience. And now we have this (laughs) scrawny-looking little dog, (laughs) malnourished, with with tufts of hair in different lengths. (laughs) Oh, baby. What to do with her? Uh, The finder didn't want to keep her, but they showed her to a young soldier who had a lot of experience with dogs. His name was Bill Wynn, W-Y-N-N-E. He was a 22-year-old, he was 22 years old at the time and from Ohio. Wynn had graduated from the USAAF photo lab, technician school at Lowry Field, and then the aerial photo school in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He had enlisted to serve in World War II in January of 1943 and was sent to the Southwest Pacific, where he served as an aerial photographer, a lab technician, and a camera installer. What a fascinating, fascinating and important career, really. I think he had, even after the war, a very interesting life. Yeah. Bill took one good long look at this little creature and he decided to keep her. He handed over two Australian dollars that the soldier requested. Back then, that amount equaled $6.44, and according to the inflation calculator, that would be 110 US dollars today. 
So, of course, that's not considered a lot of money for a dog today for us. But back then, back in 1944, for a soldier stationed overseas, paying the equivalent of over $100. And I checked, apparently, soldiers in World War II, depending on their rank, the lowest rank, earned $50. I think that shows some dedication to take good care of her. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. So now he has this little dog, and he decides to name her Smokey, without an E. Oh. Not long after the soldier and the little dog became a team, Bill got sick. He suffers from dengue fever, and he has to go to the hospital for five days. Dengue fever is a viral infection that is transmitted through the bite of a mosquito, and it's prevalent in tropical and subtropical regions around the world. The symptoms are typically high fever, severe headache, muscle and joint pain, a rash, and in some cases, mild bleeding from the nose or gums. Oh shit, I think I have dengue fever. It's fine. It's fine. Well, it's not that bad, Annie, because in most <laughs> cases, symptoms resolve within a week or two, but in some cases, the disease can progress to a more severe form called dengue hemorrhagic fever, which actually can be life-threatening. Yeah, you don't want that. No, and there's also really not much you can do when it comes to specific treatment for it. Basically, it's pain relief, hydration, and sleep. So it's best to prevent it altogether. You know, sleep with a mosquito net, uh, use mosquito repellent, and try to control the mosquito population through, you know, measures such as eliminating standing water. Yeah. Bill now has dengue, and apparently it was a mild case, but he's at the hospital. What would happen to Smokey? Who should take care of her? Well, the nurses are kind, and they allow Bill's friends to bring over Smokey, and she can stay at the hospital with Bill. Aww. During the night, she sleeps on Bill's bed, and in the mornings, the nurses pick her up and take her on patient rounds with them. Aww. And the other patients, they are always happy to see that friendly little dog. The wounded and sick soldiers, they laugh, and they try to teach her some tricks, and, you know, they carry her around while rolling in their wheelchairs when they recover from, from leg wounds, stuff like that. The mood was definitely lighter whenever Smokey made her rounds. Bill felt better soon enough and could leave the hospital, and that's when Smokey's adventure really started. Smokey spent the following two years serving in the war, joining Bill Wynn on combat missions across the Pacific. They faced many challenges. They were living in tents in New Guinea, in the New Guinea jungle uh, and rock islands. They were enduring the equatorial heat and humidity. Smokey slept on a green felt card table cover in Bill Wynn's tent, and they shared Bill's sea rations and the occasional can of spam. You see, Smokey was not an official army dog and therefore had no access to food nor to veterinary medicine. But despite all that, Smokey never fell ill without developing any poor ailments that were often typical for war dogs. Yeah. During her time with the 5th Air Force 26th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron in the South Pacific, that's a mouthful. Yeah, <laughs> good one. Smokey flew on 12 air and sea rescue and photo reconnaissance missions, and she was dangling in a soldier's pack near machine guns for long hours. Oh. She was credited with 12 combat missions and awarded 8 battle stars, she survived 150 air raids uh, in New Guinea and a typhoon at Okinawa. <laughs> Smokey even had her own little parachute and used it to jump from a 9 meter or 30 feet tall tree. Oh, that was her jump training. I can't even stand it. <laughs> she's so tiny, you guys. Wait till you see. She's tiny. You could hold her in one hand. She's tiny. She's so tiny. Smokey also saved Bill's life by warning him of incoming shells, and she guided him to safety during an anti-aircraft gunnery that hit eight men that were just standing right next to them. <sighs> Bill used to call Smokey his, quote, angel from a foxhole, end quote. And it's true, dogs truly are angels without wings, and I really don't know how we deserve them. No, we don't. That's That's how. You know what I like about the, the Smokey story is that she, you always hear of these heroic dogs, like... Balto you know, the Husky, or... Yeah, big dogs and, and strong. Smokey is a teeny, tiny, tiny little teeny, lady. tiny dog. Yeah. She's it's not so like cute. Sergeant Stubby, who's like big and muscular, or... Sergeant yeah. Stubby's another good one. And when Smokey wasn't parachuting out of trees, <laughs> or saving Smokey. Bill's life, she was actually learning tricks that would come in handy later on. Bill later said that Smokey taught him 
just as much as he taught her, and that over time she developed a repertoire of tricks that exceeded any other dog of the time. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that Smokey's bravery and loyalty made her a hero. She saved 250 men from danger and probably death. Yeah. How? Well, let me quote this from the National Geographic. Uh, They did a series of articles about dogs serving in wars, and this one was titled Dogs at War, Smokey, a Healing Presence for Wounded World War II Soldiers. For centuries, military dogs have played important roles on the battlefield. And it's by Rebecca Frankel, and it was issued on 22nd of May 2014. Quote, Every day, waves of Japanese planes attack the Allied airfield at Lingayen Gulf of Luzon, the largest of the Philippine islands. The onslaught was taking a toll on communication, and the American commanders urgently needed to run telephone lines through a pipe that stretched roughly 70 feet underground uh, from the base to three separate squadrons. But they lacked the proper equipment. I think it's 20 meters, probably 25. I'm not sure. I have to check. Uh, yeah, probably 20, 25. Yeah, usually roughly yeah. divide by three, right? Roughly. So yeah, 20, 22 meters, something like that. 23 meters. The article continues. The pipe was just eight inches in diameter and the only way to put the lines in place would be to do the job by hand, having dozens of men dig a trench to get the wires underground a dangerous job that would have taken days and left the men exposed to the constant enemy attacks. So instead, they pinned their hopes on an unconventional solution, send a tiny Yorkshire Terrier through the pipe with a kite string tied to her collar. The string could then be used to thread the wire through the pipe. Calling to her, coaxing her forward was her owner, Corporal Bill Wynn, a 22-year-old Ohio native, who'd adopted her while he was in New Guinea. The little dog reached the other side, the communication network was established, and she was credited with saving the lives of some 250 men and 40 planes that day. End quote. And after the war, in an interview he gave to NBC TV, Bill described that day as follows, quote, I tied a string to Smokey's collar and ran to the other end of the culvert. Smokey made a few steps in and then ran back. Come, Smokey, I said sharply, and she started through again. When she was about ten feet in, the string caught up and she looked over her shoulder as much as to say, What's holding us up there? (laughs) The string loosened from the snag and she came on again. By now the dust was rising from the shuffle of her paws as she crawled through the dirt and mold and I could no longer see her. I called and pleaded, not knowing for certain whether she was coming or not. At last, about 20 feet away, I saw two little amber eyes and heard a faint whimpering sound. At 15 feet away, she broke into a run. We were so happy at Smokey's success that we petted and praised her for a full five minutes. End quote. Oh, she's a good girl. Before the war ended, Bill spent some time in Australia on furlough, and there he took Smokey to a military hospital to entertain the wounded soldiers. And again, what he saw was that the soldiers' faces did light up when they saw the little dog uh, when she was performing her tricks. And boy, did she learn some tricks over time. (laughs) She could ride a little scooter. She could walk on a tightrope, even when blindfolded. She could jump hoops. She could spell her name by picking up little cards with letters on them. (laughs) Bill would point a finger at her, you know, like a gun, and yell bang. And Smokey would fall to one side and play dead. Many dogs can do that, but then she wouldn't even move when you would pick her up from the floor. Oh, my friends had a cocker spaniel that would do that, and you could pick it up and it would just stay dead until you gave it the, and it would say, you're alive, <laughs> and then it would jump up, but you could like, you could, it was just floppy. <laughs> it's the best. It's so funny. I've never even attempted that. I'm just proud when he stays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it comes. We're still working on come. It's like, eh, it's getting better. Apparently, after the war, Smokey appeared in 42 television shows performing tricks, <gasps> and not once did she repeat a trick. That's how many things she, she could do. She has more do. skills than me. <laughs> She's more talented than I am. It's fine. Bill and Smokey kept visiting military hospitals, and they kept entertaining soldiers, and the Yank Down Under magazine once called her, quote, champion mascot in the Southwest Pacific area, end quote. Uh, by the way, Yank was a magazine published by the U.S. Army during World War II. It was available to soldiers overseas at first, later on, even back home in the U.S., but it was never available uh, to civilians at newsstands, for example. So, I'm a Yankee. I get it. But 
That seems like the name of a dirty magazine to me. <laughs> like, Hi, could I have the newest copy of Yank Down Under? It's like hidden under a paper. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I would just wonder if anyone else was disappointed by what they found in a Yank magazine. Sorry. <laughs> uh. So, after the war, Bill returned home. And, of course, he took Smokey with him. Can you imagine? The war ended and Bill just left. <laughs> Bye, Smokey. Bye, Smokey. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> but Smokey was fine. He had skills. He was an employable Yorkie. <laughs> uh, no, he took her with him. And the, the very lovable, very friendly Yorkie became somewhat of a national sensation. And she even helped to make Yorkshire Terriers popular again because their popularity had declined in the US in the 1940s. Oh, she's so cute. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody wanted to have a Yorkie. Bill and Smokey traveled the whole nation. They appeared, as I said, on many TV shows. I was checking and I was hoping to find a recording of Smokey doing tricks from, from one of these shows, but I couldn't. Uh, there was nothing on YouTube or any other platforms. If you out there know where to find it, please send us a link. I really want to see. I see yeah. There's lots of photos. And we love Smokey. Yeah, of course, they also kept visiting hospitals. And when it became clear how valuable dogs are to help people recover, many, many dog owners volunteered their dogs for visits to veteran hospitals. And Smokey and these dogs kind of were some of the first therapy dogs. Smokey then finally retired from touring in 1955 and died peacefully in her sleep two years later. And it's assumed she was 14 years old around the time. We can't say for sure, of course, because it's unknown when she was born exactly. Right, how old she was when he found her. She yeah. could have been... A year or two. Hard to know, know, right? But something like that, yeah. yeah. Bill said about her that, quote, she was just an instrument of love, mm. end quote. Yeah. Bill buried Smokey in a World War II ammo box in the Cleveland Metro Park's Rocky River Reservation in Lakewood, Ohio. And 50 years after her death, a memorial was erected over her resting place. And the stone reads, and I love this, it reads, Smokey, the Yorkie Doodle Dandy, <laughs> and the dogs of all wars. Yeah. Mm. And on top is a sculpture by the artist Susan Bahari, and it's Smokey sitting in a GI helmet, and it's modeled after one of the most famous and iconic photos of the heroic dog. I'm sure most of you know it, but we're going to share it in our Facebook group. So cute. In 1996, Bill wrote a book titled Yorkie Doodle Dandy, or The Other Woman Was a Real Dog. <laughs> now that's a book title. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wynn. And it's... Cr it chronicles his experiences with Smokey during and after the war. Uh, the book highlights their service in the Pacific and their adventures in Hollywood. And it also includes tips on dog training, which, I mean, he must have known how to train them tricks, <laughs> I mean. apparently. Frequently asked questions about Yorkshire Terriers and so much more. The book also shares the story of how Smokey was promoted to corporal. <laughs> oh. And provides a possible explanation of how the Yorkshire Terrier ended up in New Guinea. And that's it. The story of Smokey, the brave little dog who survived World War II in the Southwest Pacific and saved so many men. Oh, these stories make me cry. <laughs> Honestly, there would have been so many dogs we could have talked about. Like Judy the Pointer, you know her? The, the mm. British ship's dog? Nope. She was a prisoner of war in like three different camps and they kept the soldiers kept smuggling her in and out of the camps with them because... Uh, yeah, she was, she should have been put, you know, down. The funny thing it's is, a, like, it's a great story. Yeah. It, it isn't, if I avoid the stories usually because they just make me cry. I don't know why I get so emotional about dogs, but I guess it's a thing. It's a thing. To see how these soldiers, for example, they were in such a horrible situation themselves, but they took care of the dog. And it says so much about the bond between dogs and and hum humans. humans, yeah. That's right. I mean, I also think they would have taken care of cats and, and other pets. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's just dogs. No, of course. Yeah, I think our something good today is... It's definitely dogs, isn't dogs. it? It's dogs. <laughs> it's dogs. It's dogs. Yeah. Dogs. They're the best. They really are. Opus, Paul's been really sick the last week. He's He's better, but he's been so congested that the snoring situation... So he's sleeping just across the hall... And Opus has been sleeping with me. 
And he has been so snuggly and nice lately. And like, we've gotten into a really good sleeping routine. And then Paul's going to come back to bed and ruin it. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to Paul. You need a family Paul, bed. Paul coming like back. Like two king size next to each other. I, we don't have enough room in our room. Then make just a giant bed. I know. As much as you we do, in and you'll, you know, jump from the door into bed. That's pretty much, yeah. We looked to see if we could add another. There's... That's what you'd have to do. You'd have to leap from the door straight onto the bed <laughs> if we wanted another <laughs> Great Dane. So, yeah. Dogs. All animals. All the animals. But today, specifically dogs. So, things you should know. We mentioned Patreon earlier. You can go to patreon.com or uh, go to our website, freshhellpodcast.com. Either way, you will find our Patreon information. It's very random. No matter what level you donate at, we are just really, really grateful. Our Facebook group is so much fun. It is just the nicest group of people. I know we say that all the time, but really sincerely. No, it's truly the only reason for being on social media anymore. Yeah, I think a lot of yep. people feel that way. It's so what we talk about are cases, obviously cases and stories that we've covered, as well as things happening you know, currently and what's happening around where you live. Art, jewelry, house porn, dogs, weird stories, advice, you name it. It's, yeah, yeah it's just a nice place to be. So come say hi. We also have a Facebook page. You can go ahead and like that. If you are listening to this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And thank you for the comments that you leave. We always try to go in and respond i'm always so happy 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 when people leave us comments yeah. in youtube so Me thank too. you thank you for that our email address is freshhellpodcast at gmail.com what else if you liked this episode or any of our other episodes please go to your podcast app and check if you can leave us a rating and or review they're really so important for us not only for the algorithm you know but for us personally mentally we love them. Mm -hmm. We love to read them. And that's it. Tell your pets we said hi. Hug them. Cuddle them. Especially the dogs this time because, I mean, we talked about them this week. As Winston Churchill once famously said during World War II, if you're going through hell, keep going. Cheers. Bye. Bye.